schema you have the archetypal son and we'll get to why it's masculine and not feminine and that's also taken me a long time to crack because the women in this class have always asked me well the hero in mythological stories is male where does that leave women? and I never knew what to say about that exactly you, you can look at Sleeping Beauty for example that, that, that story and Sleeping Beauty is raised, rescued by a prince and you can think of that prince at two levels of analysis simultaneously you can think about it as an actual male who plays that role but you can also think about it as the exploratory and exploratory assertive and courageous part of the feminine psyche that's necessary to bring unconsciousness up into consciousness and the story works perfectly across both those levels of analysis so, so and that is, that is the classic way I would say of of explaining this particular mode of representation but it came to my attention this was so interesting this is this is what triggered this for me finally I was reading this book called a billion wicked thoughts that was written by a bunch of engineers at Google and they were looking at billions of search uh, billions of Google searches and you know there's a, no shortage of pornography on the internet and, it, and there's much less by proportion than there was when the internet was first invented and it's so interesting because it actually turned out that one of the things that drove the development of the internet and the technology was the proclivity of young men to search out sexually provocative images that was what was at the forefront of the development of the net it's extraordinarily interesting they were motivated to they were motivated to use it for that purpose and that provided the platform from which it emerged amazing anyways the google engineers looked at pornographic search processes and then segregated male searches from female searches and what they found was that the male searched out images surprise surprise no one no one considers that you know particularly interesting but the female searched out literary representations of pornography it was written and so I can give you an example of that if you know about Harlequin romances does everybody still know about those anybody not know about those okay well they're mass market romances and of, of a very stereotypical type and uh, they're, the original ones were pretty harmless in, in terms of no violence and no real sexual contact, con content but that was 40 years ago and they've differentiated tremendously and now there's hardcore harlequin romances and with, with particularly garish covers and then there's the old you know more tame basic sexless and aggressionless romances where everything is implied and not explicit but the explicit ones exist so they did a plot analysis of the typical pornographic female fantasy well and it was so it's so comical because engineers did this and social scientists would never do this because they'd be probably too concerned about the ethics of it or some damn thing but engineers you know they'll just plow ahead with no concern whatsoever for such things and they actually discover things that way and so they they discovered the basic plot of the female pornographic literary product and they identified, so basically what happened was that a innocent, well-meaning and attractive young woman encounters a male who's a bit of a monster and the monster, there's five types of classic male monster for all you males who want to know, this is what you can become vampire, that's a good one, werewolf, billionaire, pirate and surgeon okay, so that's very interesting because well, first of all, there's a dominance thing. There's a, now you're actually blushing. You know, you're actually blushing about that. That's very, very funny. So, <laughs> sorry to point it out, but it's so comical, you know. I know, I know. It's so funny. I, I was reading this. I was reading this. It was just cracking me up. I thought, oh my God, really? Pirate, vampire. Oh, that explains it. What about all these damn vampire shows, right? They're so popular online. They're so popular on Netflix. Oh yes, and then there's the werewolf. There's nothing sexier than a werewolf, apparently. But I mean, so there's predatory do there's predatory dominance that's implicit in that, right? With the billionaire, it's more abstract, but clearly that's an indication of very high success in the male dominance hierarchy. So, but there's this desire for aggression that's in that, a real aggression. Right? And it's not surprising to me, to me at all, it makes perfect sense. Um, but, what, but the basic plot is that the woman encounters this mysterious and aggressive male and tames him. That's the female hero myth as far as I can tell. 
but it's Beauty and the Beast. And so it's because, well, there's no fun in taming someone who's already tame. And what makes you think you really want someone who's tame anyways? There's no interest in that. Plus, when, when, when chaos manifests itself, what makes you think that someone tame is going to be good for anything? And it's a real question, and so that aggression is absolutely vital, it's absolutely necessary. But, because it's inc incredibly dangerous, which of course it is, it has to be civilized. And so what happens is that the archetypal female in these pornographic romances seduces and tames the aggressive male. And that's her encounter with chaos. Now it's more, it's more comp... Of course females, they're more complicated, and that's exactly how it is, and it's no wonder, because they're their lives are more complicated.